Good evening and welcome back. Here's a guy demonstrating what is called a standing wave on a string. That's a topic that we'll take up in chapter 17. I can touch it and it still is working. So the node is not moving. Here it's moving up and down and here it's moving up and down. And we'll see that in a second with the high speed camera. So here we have what's called the second harmonic. It's the second possibility for a stand. Sorry to cut you off there, bud. But my main reason for showing you that right now is so that you could be confident that the angle that the string makes with the horizontal is typically very small when you're talking about actual waves on strings. So I've tried to show what that angle is uh, at its maximum. And if I had to estimate that, I'd put it at something like 10 degrees. I think that angle might be slightly larger in these waves that you can see on guitar strings here, but still small. And if you're wondering, hey, how come I've never seen that before? I've been around guitars, I've watched people playing guitars, or I play guitar, maybe you're thinking. It has to do with the frame rate on the phone. Well, oh, I say phone, but it could just be a normal camera, digital camera. So in this sequel, in this presentation, that will be a very important fact that the angle the string makes with the horizontal is always around 10 degrees or less. So let me remind you, or maybe this is the first time you're hearing it if you have not yet taken second semester calculus. I believe you've all taken second semester calculus, which means you've been exposed to Taylor series, Maclaurin series. Here are the Maclaurin series for the three familiar trig functions. And in particular, let me draw your attention to sine and tangent. <clears throat> now these identities are only valid if you're entering your angle in radians. And I really encourage you to try this right now if you've never done it. Take your calculator, make sure you're in radian mode and calculate the sign of a small number like 0 0.02, something close to zero. And you'll find that the output of the function is almost the same as the number you put in. So for small angles, the sine of theta is approximately just theta. And the same is true for tangent. Tangent of theta is also approximately just theta. Some of you may recall that the, the subsequent terms in the Maclaurin series for sine include powers, odd powers of theta. So theta cubed over three factorial, theta, theta to the fifth. And those are much smaller than theta if you're talking about small values of theta, right? If you take a very, very small number and cube it, it's even smaller. And certainly to the fifth power is really small. Now, how small does theta need to be in order for that approximation to be useful? This graph gives us the answer. This is a plot of three functions. Now they're using the variable x. So we all know that y equals x is a line that makes an angle of 45 degrees with the x-axis. The, the green function here is the sine of x. And you can see how it starts to scoop down until it reaches a maximum of, of 1 at pi over 2 radians. And we know that tangent will eventually approach in, uh, a vertical asymptote. But for small values of theta, those three functions are virtually indistinguishable, at least to our eyes in this graph here. <clears throat> and you can see that as long as the angle in radians is less than 0.2, let's say, those functions are really close together. So for most purposes, it's totally sufficient to make this, um, this approximation. And we will be using this several times this semester when we, when we get to ray optics and use trigonometry to explore the behavior of lenses and spherical refracting surfaces, we are going to use these identities repeatedly. Okay, is my computer stuck? What's happening here? Here's some functions that show us the percent error between the approximation and the true value of, for instance, sine. And you can see that, uh, can I zoom in here? You can see that for theta equal to 
If I move over here, the error error is less than 2%. If this is 10%, what is this? Two, four, six, eight. Yeah, so I believe we're at less than 1% error. And I checked that on my own calculator and that's legitimate. If you were to compute uh, the error, well, not so much the error, but look what I've done here. Um, I've converted 0.1 radians because you can tell from this error graph that, that the approximation is great for angles equal to 0.1 radians or less. If you can convert 0.1 radians into degrees, you find that it's about six degrees. And even uh, 0.2 radians, that's only 11 and a half degrees. So as a general rule, let's say if you're talking about angles approximately equal to 10 degrees or less, for most purposes, or for most of our purposes, we can be confident that the small angle approximation, as it's called, is valid. So sometimes it's called the small angle approximation. I've also seen it called the skinny triangle approximation, which is more fun. Well, we're going to use that in just a sec here. These, these angles are exaggerated. Now, yeah, if you're playing with a jump rope or later I've got a graphic of these um, battle ropes that people are using to work out now, those angles are certainly larger than 10 degrees. But in a, in a string that's been pulled taut or the standing waves that you saw at, at the video at the beginning, those angles are considerably smaller. But it, uh, unless we exaggerate the angle and zoom in, it makes it difficult uh, to do the math that we're about to do or to do the analysis using Newton's second law. So just for the purposes of this uh, free body diagram really is what we're going to be doing we have to exaggerate the angle. So let's focus our attention on one little piece of the rope. It doesn't have to be a single atom. Let's just call it, um, maybe it's a millimeter long <clears throat> and it weighs just a tiny fraction of a gram. And the, the slope or the direction of the rope at that point makes an angle with the horizontal that I will call phi, or maybe you prefer phi. And it's been a while maybe since you've talked a whole lot about Newton's second law. Since you're taking 3C, maybe you took 3B last semester. But let's never forget our, our fundamental dynamical equation, F equals MA. Before you can apply F equals MA, you have to decide what your M is. What's the mass that you're looking at? And for us, it's the mass of this tiny piece of string. Now, you can tell that this distance here, uh, the, the arc length of this piece of string is greater than this segment on the x axis, which they're calling delta x. So clearly this is longer than delta x in the picture. But remember, the angle here has been exaggerated. So for actual waves on strings, this, uh, this arc length is more nearly equal to this horizontal distance. So let's just regard the arc length here as being equal to delta x. And if we happen to know the linear mass density of the string, all we have to do is multiply that by the length of this little piece. And now we know the mass of that little piece of string in kilograms. So let me use non-SI units for just a second. Let's say that you've determined, maybe you, you took a, a hundred yard spool of string, you put it on a kitchen scale <clears throat> and you determined its weight. And maybe you found out that the, that the string weighs something like 0.02 ounces for every inch. Now, those are not SI units, but you could convert that into kilograms per meter. It just it just tells you the the weight, so to speak. I, I know weight and mass are not the same thing. It tells you the weight of the string per unit length. But in in SI units, that would be kilograms per cubic meter. What's happening here? Before I get to that next slide, what's the meaning of these arrows here? T is for tension. In this context. Capital T is not for period, it's for tension. So the remember, we've just focused our attention on one little piece of the string. Well, the rest of the string to the left is pulling on this piece of string and it's pulling it in that direction. That force that exists within the string is what we call tension. Over here, the tension is directed in a different direction because remember, we always assume that the tension is parallel to the string. If the direction of the string changes, so does the tension. So the tension that exists on the right end points in a different direction. And you can see these vectors here, these force vectors, because don't forget the tension is a force, 
These force vectors do not sum to zero, which means there is a net force on this piece of string. You could almost consider this a free body diagram. Really, we'd, we would want to replace this drawing of the string by just an X and draw the vectors with their tails on X. You may be thinking, what about, uh, what about gravity? You haven't accounted for gravity. Well, wouldn't you agree that the tension in a string is, is under most circumstances greater than the weight of this tiny little piece of string? If it's really like a millimeter of string we're talking about, it, that's not going to weigh very much. And even if you've got a couple of newtons, only a couple of newtons of tension in the string, that's definitely more than gravity. So we can, we can regard the gravitational force on this piece of string as negligible in comparison to the other forces, namely the tension. So in a moment, we'll, we'll take a more careful look at the components of these forces, but you can probably tell already that when you sum these two forces, you find that the net force points upward-ish, and that's going to produce an acceleration of that piece of string. All right, well, the, a piece of string consists of a great many particles, far greater than these four coupled oscillators, which I showed you in a previous video, but it's very much the same thing. Or they're very similar. You can imagine that the particles of the string are like these individual styrofoam balls or whatever these are, and the coupling between them, rather than being an actual physical string here, is some sort of uh, a electromagnetic interaction, some sort of bond. Um, as you go further into physics and chemistry, and full disclaimer, I know very little about chemistry, but I do know that the bonds between particles are often quantum mechanical in nature. So it's not enough to just talk about electric charge and the attraction between charges in order to explain them. But I'll just summarize all that by saying that there are electromagnetic interactions between the particles of the string. And you can think of those interactions like these connecting strings between these couple oscillators. So the, the wave phenomenon that we see on strings, once again, is a lot like the, the group behavior of these coupled oscillators. So just like in the previous picture where the, the Pearson graphic had the force vectors coming off of just that little piece of string, we could look at the force vectors being applied to just one of these coupled oscillators. And if you'd like, you can think of those interactions also as springs because uh, I'm assuming this is some kind of string and you can stretch a string and it's not impossible to stretch a string, but it, the, the more you want to stretch it, the harder you're going to have to pull on it, which is how a spring behaves, right? The more stretched a spring is, the harder it pulls back. So strings and springs are, are more similar than you might have imagined. This FET simulation, which we've already looked at, uh, probably makes it a little easier to make the conceptual jump from four coupled, coupled oscillators that you saw in the previous photo and a string, which is composed of a great multitude of particles, many more than even the beads that you see here. Okay, so back to our, our diagram to which we will apply Newton's second law. Let's just check the dimensionality here. We know that the mass of this piece of string should have units of kilograms, but the length has units of meters. So the mass density, the so-called linear mass density must have units of kilograms per meter. And you may be thinking if you're a discerning student here, oh, you know, not to uh, suggest that if you didn't think of this, you're not discerning, but this probably should be called Delta M because it's a tiny little piece of mass. I would call it Delta M and reserve the letter M for the mass of the entire string, but that's not what your book chose to do. So we'll go with M. Okay, so back to this angle phi. At the right end of the string, uh, because the, the curvature of the string would have to be continuous, uh, right here the string would, would move off in this direction. This is the direction of the tangent line. And the angle that it makes with the horizontal axis is what we'll call phi sub two. So I'm using the index two for the right end of the string, of the piece of string, and the index one for the left end. And here is a rather subtle point. What do you think happens to the tension in a guitar string when you pull up on the string? 
clearly it goes up because if you pull hard enough, the string will actually break. So there's got to be some dependence of tension on how far you've uh, pulled it. So in general, if you increase the length of a string, the tension within the string goes up. And since this string is not flat, you know, undisturbed, it would just be a horizontal line. Since it's presumably now wavy, we've now incre increased the total length of the string. And that would mean that the tension has, has changed throughout the string. However, remember, with actual standing waves on strings, usually the amplitude is small, the angles are small, which means the total length of the string has not changed by much. So we're going to make the approximation, it's a very good approximation, that the magnitude of the tension on both sides is the same. Notice this is not uh, an equality between vectors. It's an equality between the magnitudes. I didn't write T1 with the vector symbol, I just wrote T1. Remember that convention? Your book follows this convention. If there's no vector symbol, you're talking about the length of those vectors. Obviously these vectors are not equal because they point in different directions, but we'll pretend that their magnitudes are the same and then there's no need to distinguish the two tensions. We just call them T. That's the magnitude of both tensions. We can use trigonometry to find that the vertical component of the tension on the right side would be hypotenuse times the sine of phi two. And that gets a plus sign because it's pointing up. On the left side though, the vertical component of tension T1 points down. And I've tried to emphasize that this angle right here is the same as this angle. I think those are called alternate exterior angles. Uh, I forget what the term is from geometry, but that would make the, the vertical component negative T sine phi one. So just to be clear, phi one is the angle that the string makes with the horizontal on the left side. Phi is always the angle between the string's tangent line and the horizontal. So once again, we're applying F equals MA to this piece of string. So I like to do that thing with the blue bubble just to make it clearer what the M is in F equals MA. And specifically, we're looking at the forces in the vertical direction. I've kind of glossed over this point, but it's not hard to argue that the horizontal components balance, they sum to zero because the this little piece of string is not jiggling left and right, it's jiggling up and down. In other words, it's, it's accelerating up and down vertically. So we're interested in the net force vertically. Here's my uh, Y component of the vector equation F equals MA. What did I just do there? I think I just scooted things over so we have more room. And the only forces I see on this piece of string vertically are these two components of the, the two tensions. Again, I've neglected gravity. It's totally insignificant. And what have I done here? Well, let me go back. We know that M, the mass of this little piece is just the mass density times the length of that little piece of string. So I'll substitute mu delta X. That's the Greek letter mu, not meow, mu. What else can we do? Acceleration, we all know is the second time derivative of position. Can I make that substitution? Aha, no, I'm saving that for later. What I'm doing instead is first invoking the small angle, also called the skinny triangle approximation. Since these angles are small, 10 degrees or less, we know that sine of phi is basically the same as phi, which is basically the same as tangent of phi. So that's another way you should memorize it. Sine of phi, tangent phi, basically the same for small angles in radians. And then can we just factor out the tension? Sure. So the next step will be to look at the acceleration in the y direction. So let's remember that if there were no disturbance, if we weren't forcing sinusoidal oscillations here, presumably the string would be taut and it would be along this horizontal line. Obviously in real life, it's going to sag a little bit because of gravity, but never mind that. And each little piece of the string can, uh, can be assigned an x coordinate with respect to some origin. We've already talked about this in the previous video, video when we looked at the wave equation. So this piece of the string has some particular coordinate. 
it's like an index that specifies which particle you're discussing in the string. And we agreed to do what the book does and use the symbol capital D to represent the displacement of that piece of string from equilibrium. So it's equilibrium positions right here, but as the wave passes by, sometimes it's displaced upwards, sometimes it's displaced downwards. So the displacement depends on where you are on the X axis. In other words, which particle you're talking about. Obviously, if we were talking about this particle of string, it would have a different X coordinate. And it also depends on time. It, for any location, the displacement changes with time. And just for now, to make the notation here seem more familiar, since we're going to be using calculus, in calculus you like to talk about dy dx and y of x, let's refer to the displacement with the letter y. So this is like our x-axis, and the height of each piece of the string will be denoted by this variable y, and y depends on x, and of course it depends on time. We're just replacing capital D with y. And then if we zoom in here, it makes it easier to understand that if we go from one position on the string to another position on the string right next door, so adjacent, there's a little scoot horizontally, which we can call dx. dx because we're, I'm imagining that it's an infinitesimal little scoot. This is obviously not infinitesimal, it's finite, but you get the idea. If I drew an infinitesimal little scoot, you wouldn't see anything. And what would be the point of that? And also we would have to move vertically by an amount dy to get to that next place on the string. And what I've done here is draw a, a line segment in the direction of the rope, basically the, the tangent direction. And if we take the ratio of the opposite side, that's the vertical displacement to the adjacent side, well, isn't that tangent? Tangents opposite over adjacent. And maybe you're, you're now getting a sense of why we call it the tangent function. This is probably one reason why that name was chosen. So the tangent of uh, phi, which is the angle that the rope or the string makes with the horizontal, is equal to dy dx. It's, it's literally the derivative of the function which describes the shape of the string. Okay, so that's a substitution we'll be making as we go further. We've already seen the tangent of phi pop up in our little derivation here with Newton's second law. Now we can replace that by dy dx, where dy is really the change in the displacement. Remember, if none of these particles had any displacement, they would all be hanging out here. This um, piece of the string has this displacement. The piece of the string here has a slightly greater displacement. So dy, which I could have called d capital D, dd, that's awkward. Um, that's the change in the vertical displacement. And dx is just the amount by which we scooted horizontally. Okay, so we go back to where we were, and now we can replace these tangent functions with the derivative of the y-coordinate of the string with respect to x. Are you familiar with this notation? dy dx with the vertical line and x2 means evaluate the derivative of y with respect to x at position x2. That's at the right end of the string. That's all that means. Evaluate this derivative at coordinate x2, and then evaluate the same derivative at coordinate x1, and we're subtracting the two. And now we're getting closer to the result that we're seeking. Ooh, what did I do there? I snuck in another substitution. The acceleration of this piece of string is just the rate of change of its velocity, and its velocity is the rate of change of its position. So it's really the second derivative of the y-coordinate of the string. As it oscillates up and down, it's got a vertical acceleration. So we can replace a sub y with the second derivative of the displacement, because remember the displacement is the y-coordinate with respect to time. Okay, so I've rewritten that here. What comes next? Let's change notation ever so slightly. Uh, instead of calling the left side x1 and the right side x2, let's just call the left coordinate x and then the right core. Oh, I've got these backwards. I have to fix this. Hang on a second. <laughs> 
Okay, now this equation looks a little crowded, but I'm referring to the left end of the string as coordinate x and the right end is x plus delta x. So this is the derivative of y with respect to x, that's the, the slope of the string evaluated at the right side, let me get my laser pointer, minus the slope of the string evaluated at the left side. Hopefully you've been able to follow all these steps, just F equals MA so far and, and some use of derivatives. Does any of this look familiar? Evaluating a function uh, at two locations that are close to each other and then we've got this delta X over here. So I'm going to remind you that this quantity in parentheses is called the difference quotient because it's really the quotient of two differences. This is the change in the value of a function. And then the denominator is really the change in the value of X. If you're evaluating a function F of X, um, you know, X plus H minus X is just H. So this is the, the change in the X coordinate. This is the resulting change in the function. We call that the difference quotient. If we were talking about X as a position of time, this would really be the average velocity when you take the limit of average velocity as the time interval goes to zero, you get what's called um, instantaneous velocity, which we know is the derivative with respect to time of position. So I'm connecting this here to a familiar example. I'm just reminding you what a derivative is, how it's defined mathematically. It's the limit of the difference quotient. So let's take this delta X and put it on the other side. We'll divide both sides by delta X. And hopefully you, you now realize that that's exactly what we're looking at. This is a difference quotient. Remember, y is a function of x. That's uh, the shape of the string. dy dx is the derivative of that shape, but that's just another function. So dy dx is a function of x. We're evaluating that function on the right side of this interval. We're evaluating it on the left side, and then we're taking the difference that corresponds to the numerator here. And then we're dividing by the difference in the coordinate. This is the change in the derivative over the width of the piece of string. Does that make sense? Well, we're just calculating the change in the slope, really. It's the change in the slope divided by the width of the string. And now let's take the limit of this equation as we let delta x approach zero. So look at this quantity for shorter and shorter little pieces of string you know, get down to a hair's width and then less than that. So in that limiting process, notice I've highlighted delta X everywhere it appears. This becomes the derivative of dy dx. Well, what is the derivative of the derivative? That's what we call the second derivative. And you'll notice I've had to switch from, excuse me, ordinary lowercase d's to the script D because I'm acknowledging or I'm recalling that this quantity Y, which is the displacement of the string, it really depends on two variables. It depends on where you are on the string, that's X, and also what time you're at, which is T. So we're really talking about a partial derivative with respect to X. If you know the function depends on several variables, you're forced to use partial derivatives. Okay, so let's rewrite this now with the other notation second derivative of position with respect to X. And I'm sure now you've got bells going off in your head because if you watched the last video, this looks familiar. Let's rearrange this once more. I'll put the time derivative on the left side and divide by, uh, yeah, I'll divide both sides by mu and we get this, aha. What did I do there? I reverted back to our old notation. So we used the letter Y just now to make the calculus look more familiar. Now that we're done, let's go back and use the books notation. The displacement might be better called capital D. And that's the equation that we were looking for. So I gave it a suitable transition there with some obnoxious stars. That is the wave equation. It may not be obvious yet, but let's compare what we've just discovered with our one dimensional wave equation from the last video. So evidently, what we've just written down is the wave equation, provided we can make this identification. 
provided that the ratio of tension to mass density of the string is equal to the square of the speed. Or maybe what the math is telling us here is disturbances can propagate down the string and they will do so with the speed given by this formula. Set these two red quantities equal and solve for V and this is what you get. So this may not be obvious, but remember the wave equation tells us that whatever the medium is, if, if this equation is satisfied, it means the medium can support uh, the propagation of disturbances through the medium. And we know that the speed or the square of the speed is the same as whatever coefficient is in front of the second derivative with respect to position. Whatever physical system you're looking at, if you apply the relevant laws of physics, in this case, it's Newton's second law, but later we will look at um, Maxwell's equations. And don't stress, if you haven't taken 3B, uh, it's fine. We're, we're gonna do very little with electromagnetism. But if you start with Maxwell's equations, instead, you can show that uh, wave disturbances should propagate through empty space. And you can calculate that speed using parameters from the theory of electromagnetism. In this case though, the math is telling us that whatever those disturbances are, they'll propagate at this speed. And let me point out that there are two types of terms here because if we have time, we will also look at the wave equation for longitudinal waves in a fluid or even a solid. And that is covered in your book. Um, and that equation looks very similar, but it doesn't make sense to talk about the tension of a bucket of water, for instance, or the linear mass density, because it's not a string. It's, it might have volume mass density. So there are related terms that show up in the, that equation. But here, the tension is what I'll call the elasticity term. It's, it's what provides that restoring force. Remember in the video about simple harmonic oscillation, the, the Hooke's law spring is what brings the mass back to equilibrium. Well, that's what the tension does here. It's, it's the springiness in the system. And the denominator has what you might call the inertial term. So the harder it is to accelerate the medium, the slower the wave speed will be. And that's why, and I, I don't have a graphic for this, but um, if you had a jump rope made out of a really heavy rope, like the type you see uh, to tie ships, you know, to moor ships at a dock, really heavy, uh, what is that, manila rope? You can imagine that waves would travel slower on those really thick ropes than they would on like dental floss that it had been, dental floss that had been pulled really tight. So we'll see some examples of this later, but isn't that remarkable that you can calculate, you can predict theoretically the speed of a wave on a string if you know the tension and the mass density. And it doesn't have to be uh, a string made out of, out of um, fibers, right? Like plant fibers. This would also apply to a metal wire, perhaps. It would apply to a piano string, a guitar string. And we're going to see that this relation will help us explain how musical instruments work. I'll point out right now that when you when you tune a guitar and you're tightening those, uh, what do you call them? Not thumb screws. I apologize for my ignorance, but when you turn the, the screws at the end of the guitar, you're really adjusting the tension. And as a result, you're affecting the speed at which a, a wave will propagate down the string. And that's going to affect the pitch produced by the string as it vibrates. And we will cover all of that in the next chapter. So here's this fun example. Is this like a new trend? I, I wasn't even aware of this until I was Googling images of waves on strings. I feel like this started with that movie 300. You know, they were doing those Spartan workouts and it became like a, a fad. But not my preferred workout regimen. I like to bake pizzas for exercise because you have to lift the, the heavy cast iron pan, you have to knead the dough, totally burns off whatever calories you're ingesting after you've baked the pizza. That's my theory at least. Okay, so here's a nice, uh, a very nice intuitive physical interpretation of the wave equation. And I confess that I, I wasn't even aware of this way of thinking about it until somewhat recently, but it makes total sense. Let's once again, look at one little piece of this rope and you can imagine the, the tension vectors on either side. You can resolve those into components and find that the horizontal components balance. So there's no net force horizontally. That's why you don't see this piece of rope 
jiggling left and right, it's going to oscillate up and down. And that would be the direction of the net force and hence the direction of the acceleration. Remember, that's the whole content of Newton's second law or half the content is that the acceleration is in the same direction as the net force. So this little piece of rope is accelerating downwards. And if our vertical axis is positive up, you know, if that's the convention we've chosen for our coordinate system, that means that the second time derivative of the displacement is negative. So if the, if the X axis is here, then right now, this piece of rope has a positive displacement, but it's currently accelerating downwards. Now, this is a subtle point. If you haven't thought about this in a while, like since 3A, this may confuse you. It's possible for this piece of rope to currently be moving upwards and yet still accelerating downwards. Maybe this piece of rope is still rising, but if, if it's rising and slowing down, it's still accelerating down. Hopefully you remember that from 3A. Now, according to this equation, since V squared is a positive number, if the left side of the equation is a negative number, so too must be the right side. So is the right side a negative number when we're looking at this piece of the rope? Well, remember from calculus, the first derivative with respect to position, uh, capital D again, is the function which describes the shape of this rope. The displacement is the height of the curve. So the first derivative with respect to x would give us the slope. The second derivative gives us curvature. And you can just look at this and see that the concavity, second derivative is also often called concavity. The concavity is negative, it's concave down. So sure enough, the two times, or the two second derivatives have the same sign. They're both negative. But this equation goes a little further than that. It doesn't just say that they have the same sign. It says that they're actually proportional. So if you were, if you were to double the curvature, you would also double the acceleration. What is the constant of proportionality? It's the square of the speed. So there's quite a bit more information in this equation than merely the statement that acceleration and curvature have the same sign. But that's an important part of it, and it's, it's very intuitive. We can do the same analysis with this piece on the bottom here. It's obviously accelerating upwards. If you were to look at the two tensions on either side, you'd find that the net force points up, and it, the curve itself is also concave up. So let me fix my slide here. So in this instance, for the piece of rope on the bottom, once again, the acceleration and the curvature at that point have the same sign. This requires some thought. This graphic was taken from your book. You have to imagine that this, uh, this shape here on the string is moving to the right. The whole thing is moving to the right. And each of these green vectors is showing you the velocity of the piece of string at that point. And you'll notice none of these arrows point left or right because none of these pieces of string is actually traveling down the rope. That would be weird, right? Each piece of the string is just shaking up and down. It, it almost looks like each piece of the string is moving to the right, but that's because the waveform as a whole is propagating to the right. But each particular, each individual particle is just moving up and down. So let's see if we can reason through why uh, this particle on the string is currently moving upwards. Well, if the whole waveform is translating to the right, then a moment later in time, just a moment from now, um, the height of the curve here is going to be here. Did I say that right? If, if this entire waveform is moving to the right, then the height at this point on the x-axis is going to be the same as it is at the present. I still don't think that's any clearer, but I think you can figure out what I'm getting at. So see how high this particle is right now? A moment later, this part of the waveform is going to be here, which means this particle is going to be right here. And then a moment after that, it's going to be at this height. A moment after that, it's going to be at this height. This, this whole time I've been talking about the future height of this particle. So it's obviously rising. And now you can see why this particle is currently moving downwards because a moment from now, 
its height will be the same as this particle because this entire waveform is traveling to the right. I don't know about you, but that requires some thought on my part. I can feel the RAM uh, revving up <clears throat> in my brain. Okay, so I'll, I'll let you uh, marinate that in your noodle. And this graph I pulled off the web, it's not as accurate, but it's supposed to be showing the acceleration of each point on the string. And what's wrong with it is that these vectors should all have different lengths. In fact, it's not hard to show that the particles that are at the peaks and the valleys would have the greatest acceleration. At least they, they're showing that um, the particle right here and here, those particles have zero acceleration. All you have to do is think about, think back to the mass on a spring, a single simple harmonic oscillator. It's, uh, think of it as being oriented vertically. It's bouncing up and down. When it gets to the top, that's when the, the uh, spring is stretched the most, which means the mass is being pulled the hardest. And F equals MA tells us that when the force is greatest, so is the acceleration. So these particles at the peaks are experiencing a greater acceleration in magnitude than the particles that are close to equilibrium. In fact, for a mass on a Hooke's law spring, as it passes through equilibrium, the spring is neither stretched nor compressed it experiences no force and hence no acceleration. So these vectors should really be longer, these should be shorter, and they've correctly shown a vector of zero length for the particles that are currently passing through equilibrium. So these vectors are obviously not the same as this set of vectors. If it helps, uh, we can draw a cartoon version of what I was just describing I was comparing the motion of each piece on the string to a simple harmonic oscillator. And that's particularly clear when you're talking about standing waves. So in the previous video, we looked at the mathematics of progressive waves where the, the entire waveform travels to the right. But at the beginning of this video, I showed you a clip of that guy demonstrating standing waves. And in chapter 17, we're going to talk about the fact that a standing wave can be expressed mathematically as two progressive waves passing through each other in opposite directions. And they have to have the same frequency and wavelength. But for the case of a standing wave where each particle is just going up and down, up and down like this, uh, it makes it even more obvious that each particle is acting like a simple harmonic oscillator. So uh, even though each particle is really oscillating because of the, uh, the tension between itself and the neighboring particles, you can just so you can um, model all of that tension as a single spring. That's not something we're going to do mathematically. I'm just pointing that out conceptually to help you remember that each piece of a string in a standing wave or a progressive wave is moving like a simple harmonic oscillator. So you can imagine those little springs in there. See how they go from the string to the equilibrium position. Okay, but let's not stretch that analogy too far. I'm fidgeting here, sorry for the outside noise. And I'd like to remind you of the brief discussion in the simple harmonic motion video about coupled oscillators. Remember I wrote F equals MA applied to mass one here, and I had to include two forces. There's the Hooke's law force because of this spring connecting M1 to the wall and then there's the other Hooke's law force due to the spring that couples the two masses. So you set the sum of the forces equal to mass times acceleration. Acceleration's on the right side. All of the forces are on the left side. And clearly there's this term that we call the coupling. We can identify that term in the equation. And that's very similar to what we're looking at now. Except instead of just two coupled oscillators, we've got a great number of couple of oscillators. However, each of these particles is really only influenced by the particles adjacent to it. You know, maybe two beads over, but certainly not 20 beads over. How could this bead experience a force from the bead over here? They're all going to be influenced by the positions and velocities of the beads nearest them. And that's really what the second derivative captures. 
we know graphically that the second derivative describes the curvature at that point. It's the local curvature. Well, you can imagine that the more curved the, the string is at that point, the more flexed it is. Uh, I'm trying to, to say something intuitive, but I think the answer is in our derivation. If you go back and look at it, I think the more curved the string is, the greater that net vertical force would be. Remember in an earlier slide, we looked at the two tension vectors on either side of the piece of string, and we looked at the extent to which they cancel because of the angles. So the more curved it is, the greater the difference you would have in the slopes on the two sides, right? Because second derivative is the rate of change of the slope. So if the slopes are very different on either side of that little piece, then the, the net force will be even greater. And saying that the slopes are very different is basically saying that you have a large second derivative. The greater or the more quickly the first derivative is changing, the greater the second derivative is. And when I say more quickly, I mean with respect to x, not with respect to time. Okay, so we can, we can say that this uh, second position derivative or space derivative plays the same role as this coupling over here. And the homework problems we do in this chapter aren't so much going to deal with that concept, but it's nice if you can connect the two in your, in your mind and understand it's really the same physics we're just talking about many more particles and the interaction is uh, not so obvious as a simple Hooke's law spring. Okay, so now you've seen the wave equation. You've, uh, you've seen a derivation of that equation for a concrete case, which is transverse waves on a string. But you should know that going forward, you may see that same equation in a variety of contexts. It's not always going to be a transverse wave. In fact, in this chapter, you can read through the derivation of the wave equation for longitudinal waves in a fluid, which is really cool. And I hope we have time to do that. You can even talk about the, um, uh, the wave equation for waves that don't even require a medium. Because the two examples I just mentioned, we looked at waves on a string. I mentioned waves in a fluid. What about the waves that exist, that exist in vacuum? that carry energy from, let's say Proxima Centauri, which is a star over four light years away from us, that, that light reaches us through a vast distance that's almost a vacuum. So if light is a wave, you know, what's it waving through? What's the medium through which it travels? It was discovered in the late or mid to late 1800s that no medium is necessary. Actually, I should qualify that. Even in the late 1800s, it was still very much up for debate whether a medium was required. People talked about this thing called the ether, and it wasn't until after Einstein in 1905 that it was very clear that the ether was an unnecessary device that had been introduced. Uh, to our modern understanding, electromagnetic waves can travel through vacuum. Anyway, here is uh, the three-dimensional wave equation. Instead of capital D for displacement, you've got this quantity U, because if you're not talking about transverse waves on a string, it might not make as much sense to talk about a displacement. It, the, with the string waves, it's the piece of string itself that's, that's waving. But with electromagnetic waves, it's not so obvious what exactly is waving. So they're, they're using this general variable u here, but you can see the second time derivative. This is the square of the speed. We like to use this very special symbol for the speed of light. Um, I don't even think they're talking necessarily about that speed here. But you'll notice that instead of just the derivative with respect to x, well, they're calling it x1, x2. You could imagine this is x, y, and z. If you took the second derivative with respect to x, the second deriv derivative with respect to y, and that with respect to z, and you add them all up, that's the three-dimensional generalization of that, of that curvature that I was just talking about. And this operator in R3 is called the Laplace operator or the Laplacian. And many of you will encounter that in the future. See, I'm not lying to you, it's right there. Let me give you one more example that is kind of fun. Um, telegraphs, it wasn't that long ago, I guess, depending on your perspective, that uh, high-speed communication was telegraph lines. So this is back in the 19th century, before radio waves came along, um, people figured out how to send signals 
down copper wires, I think decades before they figured out how to send radio waves. Now we take all this stuff for granted. But here's an, an old drawing of um, some workers setting up a telegraph line. Now, a telegraph line at the time was not the same as the modern coaxial cable. So most of you have coax cable somewhere in your home. Maybe it's going to your router or your modem. And it consists of a center wire. Here it's made out of copper wire. And then an outer conductor. If you've taken 3B, you know about capacitance between two conductors. And then you have to have some sort of insulation between them to separate them so they don't touch. But that's a little more sophisticated than, than the wires that were used for early telegraphs. I think those were more like just two wires that were parallel. And everybody's familiar with the term signal. You know, you can send signals down a wire. Your internet involves signals traveling down copper wires, maybe fiber optics. Um, actually up here in the desert, my internet comes from a satellite dish. So it involves microwaves traveling through the air. But what you should know is, and this is something I didn't understand until later in my education, those quote signals are waves. Those are waves traveling down a metal medium. And that was difficult for me to wrap my mind around because I was used to thinking of waves as something you could see. Like, you know, you can actually see the waviness when you look at water waves or waves on a string. But in the context, in this 3C physics context, a wave is really just a disturbance that can travel down a medium at a, a speed you can calculate. Um, you can describe it mathematically. So in, uh, in a book I have here at home, the, the parallel conductor, can you see this right here? The parallel conductor telegraph configuration is treated using uh, the laws of electricity and magnetism. And those of you who have taken 3B know about inductance and capacitance. <clears throat> I'll make this brief here. You're used to thinking about a capacitor is like two metal plates, maybe two concentric spheres. And you're used to thinking about an inductor as a coil of wire. Well, when you're talking about transmission lines, like these two long wires that are near each other, that system actually has what you could call distributed inductance and distributed capacitance. It has both properties that exist everywhere along the length of the transmission line. And you can come up with these uh, circuit models using what we call discrete elements. There's your little you know, individual coil of wire and your individual capacitance. You can do that. And by synthesizing the laws of electricity and magnetism, some of which you see here, um, you can wind up at an equation like this. And does that look familiar? V here is not for velocity, this capital V, it's for voltage or potential, I should say. This is the wave equation. They've replaced the letter X with the letter Z. But by using the laws of electricity and magnetism, or really um, basic circuit laws like Kirchhoff's laws, you can arrive at a wave equation. So the starting point is very different. You're not talking about F equals MA. You're not talking about the displacement of a little piece of string. You're talking instead about something much more abstract, the electric potential. And what you find is that uh, that potential varies with position and time, and it obeys the same equation that we just developed for a wave on a string. So those of you who go on and major in electrical engineering, for instance, you will see a lot of this. Always keep in mind that that uh, a disturbance traveling down a copper conductor, for instance, can be built up out of sines and cosines, progressive sinusoidal waves. And that's what makes the study of these, this basic vocabulary so important. And you can see here that the, the speed of the wave is determined by the inductance and capacitance, the distributed inductance and capacitance. So of course, you will not be tested on this. Um, I'm just pointing out that in a totally different context in physics, you wind up with the same equation and uh, a speed that depends on something other than tension and mass density. Also down here, do you see how they've expressed the potential along the transmission line as a sum of these two functions? And it's not obvious, but this is uh, X minus VT and X plus VT. They're just using the letter Z 
instead of x. And if you were to factor out the one over v here, I think you would you would wind up with the same expression. So they've just written it slightly differently, but these are the two progressive disturbances traveling opposite directions. I got that material out of this, this book, this formidable book. Uh, I find it interesting. Uh, you don't need to know this stuff, but one of the authors here, Simon Ramo, died just a couple years ago. He was, I think, 102 or 103 years old. He was still producing or being awarded patents in his 90s. And if you pull up an interview with him on YouTube, he was real sharp for his age. I mean, you close your eyes, don't look at him. He sounded like somebody in their 60s or 70s. But he was around so long, believe it or not, he was involved in the development of radar, I think prior to World War II and intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. And he even created one of the major credit bureaus. I forget if it was Equifax or Experian, but that's a long career. Guy probably made a ton of money, but he was also uh, an accomplished engineer. That's all I have to say on this matter. Oh, wait, I lied. One more thing, or two things really. Number one, this equation here evidently is sometimes called the telegraphist's equation, which I think is pretty cool. It's nice when you have a cute name for a particular equation. And more importantly, you may be wondering, what does this speed come out to be? Have you ever wondered just how fast signals travel down copper wires or maybe fiber optics? Uh, fiber optics, you could probably guess because you've been told that it's lasers and they travel at the speed of light. But what about uh, these signals traveling down copper wires? Well, when you plug in the distributed inductance and capacitance, very often you get a number that's rather close to the speed of light. Maybe it's half the speed of light or two thirds. So order of magnitude, you are talking about the speed of light and that may confuse you because you're thinking of light as something that travels through air, maybe glass, empty space, but how can light travel through copper? You can't, it's not like you can see it. You can't put your eyeball into the copper and see the light entering your eyeball. Well, it, it's not so hard to understand, especially if you've taken 3B and you recall that light is an electromagnetic wave. Electromagnetic waves can propagate through space, but they can also propagate through conductors. So it is light. It's just not light that you can see because you can't stick your eyeball into the copper and receive the wave. But there it is. Uh, if you've ever wondered how fast those signals travel, uh, it's comparable to the speed of light.